2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. It's the very last section. If you got an ESV, it'll say final words. And it really is uh, an apt title for this section in the Scripture because these are quite possibly the final words that the Apostle Peter ever wrote. They're definitely the final words that we have as the church today. They're the final words he wrote as far as Scripture. This is the second letter that he wrote, and it's sort of like how when the Apostle Paul wrote the letter that we call Galatians, Galatia was not a place, but it was a region, and it was a letter that went to multiple churches in this region. And so the Apostle Peter, as he writes what we call 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, he's writing to a, a multiple amount of churches in the same region in Southeast Asia, and he's writing to them there, and so this letter's going to multiple different churches. If you were here at our, our last member meeting, you may remember that we were in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, verses 1 through 13, and we went through that section. So now we're just going to keep going and finish out this letter in 2 Peter. But I want you to bear in mind the context of this letter so we can be fed from God's Word appropriately and we can understand what we're reading and why he would be saying certain things. So last letter that Peter writes, he says in the letter in chapter 1, I know that my departure is close, or I know that my time is coming. I know I'm going to die before too long. So just as Paul knows when he's writing to Timothy, it's like, I know my time for my departure is near. So he writes 2 Timothy, and we know that's the last thing Paul ever wrote to him, last thing that we have penned from the Apostle Paul. And so Peter, in the same way, is saying, I'm probably going to die soon. And so he writes this letter to these churches that he had already written to before, to remind them of specific things to really try to beat it into their heads, like Luther would say we need to do with the gospel. Peter's trying to do that, and he says multiple times throughout the letter, I'm doing this to remind you, to stir you up by way of reminder, and I'm telling you all these things so that after I die, you may be able to recall these things and remind yourselves of the things that I've taught. And so just as we look at 2 Timothy and go, man, that's the last thing Paul said. Really important. He wanted to make sure and nail this for Timothy, this pastor, before he dies. So it is for Peter and just Christians, not necessarily a pastor like Paul was writing to when he's writing to Timothy, but all these Christians. And I think if you were to take a poll among Christians, even biblically literate Christians, and you were to say, what are some top things that you think an apostle would say, this is what you really need to remember and know. I don't think many of us would choose what Peter highlights in this letter, except at the end of chapter 1, he wants to make sure we understand the sufficiency of God's Word and how he says it is superior to even when Peter, James, and John were on the mountaintop with Jesus and saw the Lord Jesus transfigured in all of his glory before them. He says, that was great, and we have something more sure, more fully confirmed, the Bible. So he nails that down. He wants to remind us and to stir us up by way of reminder that the Word of God is sufficient for everything that we need to know for life and godliness. It's also sufficient and better than even having, it's more sufficient, better than having some mystical personal experience. He's saying, God's Word is better than the Mount of Transfiguration. He reminds them at the beginning of chapter 1 to be diligent, basically, to make their calling and election sure, to make sure that they really do belong to Jesus. And he tells them specific things that they need to be continually, that we need to continually be putting into practice in our lives. And he says, if you do these things, you'll never fall away. And then, so that, that's like, okay, make your calling and election sure. The Bible, those may hit some of those. Survey says, what does everyone think he's going to say? And then in chapter 2, he spends the entirety of that chapter warning us, warning, warning, warning against false teachers. And then talks about how these false teachers are going to be destroyed. So he wants us to know these people trying to lead you astray, 
they're going to get what's coming to them. He spends all of chapter 2. I mean, just flip over and look how long chapter 2 is. And if it's an ESV, it's only got one little title because the, the guys who are translating this from the Greek into the English are like, it's really just one big thing. We can't even separate it into sections and put our neat little title above it. It's just false prophets and teachers. In chapter 3, so we've got the Word of God is sufficient. Watch out for false teachers. They will lead you astray. Chapter 3, Jesus is coming back. Everything will be consumed with fire, dissolved by fire. All of the evil works on the earth will be exposed. And Jesus will usher in then a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So all these things he's reminding them of, but the biggest chunk of what he's doing is warning the church against being led astray by false teachers. He's going to do that again. He's going to warn us again at the very closing of this. But in verse 14 is where we're going to read today, 14 through 18. I, I say that context so that when I read the word, therefore, I'm like, okay, that's what he's just said. Verse 13, according to Jesus' promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Oh man, that is sweet. That's the promise of Jesus' second coming for us who are in Christ. Jesus is going to come and rid the world of evil and even rid us totally of evil and sin and establish a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent to be found by him, that is Jesus, without spot or blemish and at peace. Therefore, beloved, he uses the word beloved twice in this passage, and I, I think it's probably to remind you and I, if we're reading this whole letter, he's saying, make, you better make sure you're really called and elect. Okay. You better make sure and stick to the word of God. You better make sure and not follow after false teachers. You better remember that Jesus is coming back one day and all of the evil deeds on the earth will be exposed. And any kind of thing that is idolatrous that you cling to in your life, it's going to be burned up. He's warning about these things and also reminding us of the second coming. He said some extremely harsh things in this letter. And now I think he reminds us, hey, I love you, loved ones, dear ones, therefore, dear ones. This is the same word that the Father spoke out of heaven when the sky opened, the Spirit descended at Jesus' baptism, when the Father said for everyone to hear, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. The apostle Peter is reminding us here as he's closing with exhortations, with imperatives, commands, I love you. I care about you. I know I talked about some scary stuff right there. I love you. I do it for your good. And I'm commanding you by the authority of Jesus for your good, beloved, loved ones, dear ones. Since you are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent. The word diligent, that literally means make haste, which is funny because he says, since you're waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, make haste. And he says that a few other places. Paul sometimes does that as well. It's like the old proverb, hurry up and wait. But he says, his point is that as we wait for Jesus to come back, we are not apathetic in our life in the slightest, just saying, Jesus is going to come back and make everything new. Hallelujah. And then you live lax in your life. The very next word is make haste. Endeavor. Exert yourself. Labor. This is grace-driven effort. He's saying you must be diligent. And as we have to be reminded of, I need to be frequently, Jesus loves us, and he doesn't say please. He commands. 
This is a command from the Lord. Your life, my life, should be marked by diligent, grace-driven effort. And he says, be diligent to be found by him, by Jesus, without spot or blemish and at peace. Let me explain the latter part of that before I explain the found. Without spot means without stain, free from vice, unsullied, not dirty with the filthiness of the world because all we're doing is banking on Jesus is going to come back and make everything new and I'll just kind of live how I want now. It's the same word that the Apostle James uses when he says religion that is pure and undefiled would be to visit widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The Apostle John, in the next letter over in our Bible, says the love of the world is at enmity with God. If you love the world, you don't love God. And he's reminding us to be diligent, to be found without spot or blemish. The word blemish, what's interesting, in the Greek, it's, the words are anti-words, but they translate it in the English without spot. But it's really saying to be found by him spotless or blemishless or blameless. The word, that word blemish, it's really blameless. It means without rebuke. To live your life, to be aiming to live your life in such a way that when Jesus comes back, you won't be fearful that he's just, he would have cause to rebuke you for the direction of your life being totally just selfish and worldly. He's saying, be diligent so that you're found without spot, without stain, and also blameless, without rebuke, that which cannot be censured or reprimanded. Peter knows that we're never going to get there perfectly, but he's saying what our job is as Christians, that's the aim. I want to be found by the Lord Jesus, blameless, without spot. And when he says be found by him, it, it should bring to our mind when Jesus returns or when you die. That's being found by Jesus. It's the same word Jesus uses in Matthew 24 when he tells a parable of a master and then the master has servants and he's put the servants in charge of specific things and he talks about a servant who says, eh, he's probably not going to come back anytime soon and so they are lazy with what they've been put in charge of by their master. And then he presents a servant who is basically diligent to do, his life is aimed at doing what the master has given him the charge to do. So when the master comes back, he's happy to see his slave about his business. His life is directed toward these things. And Jesus' parable says, you've been faithful with that. I'm going to give you even more. And at the end of the parable are the slaves who were not diligent in this context, weren't diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, but they were the slaves, the servants of the master who just didn't really care that much about doing what the master said because they said, ah, he's, he probably won't be back anytime soon. It's like when you sit down on the job when your boss isn't looking, those kind of things. But Jesus says at the end of that parable, those who live like that, like the servants who don't take seriously the commands of the master, says, what's the master going to come and do? And for us, we would go, oh, wow, that's probably not going to go well for them. They'll be reprimanded. No, in Matthew 24, Jesus says, the master will drag them out, cut them into pieces, and throw them outside where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Okay. We have to be sobered by the warnings of Scripture, and we have to take the commands of Jesus through his apostles and prophets seriously and not trifle with our lives. We're called to be diligent, to be found by Jesus, faithful. As our weakness permits, of course, but our life is aimed at being without spot, 
from the world, without blemish from the world, and at peace. He's getting at with at peace, even your our conscience. That you would be in a tranquil state of your mind and heart, and you wouldn't know there are things in your life, there are sins, vices, idols in your life that maybe you don't keep them right in your living room, but they're in the closet, and you're, you want to keep them around. That does not lead to the peace of God when you're living in a contradictory state, and when you're living in opposition to what you know you're gracious, merciful, empowering through the Holy Spirit, Savior has told you to do. At peace means you're, you're striving after what Jesus says. You will never have peace of your own conscience if you're making peace with the things that Jesus died for. Do you have peace in your life? Are you laboring? Are you being diligent to be found by Jesus without spot or blemish and at peace? In verse 15, he's, he continues, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Stop right there. That's possibly one of the only really confusing things that he, he sort of says right here. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. I think what he's doing in verse 15 and 14, he's showing us right before he ends his final letter, this is what the Christian life looks like. We see that in a ton of places like this shorthand. This is a good way to say what the Christian life looks like. You're being diligent to obey Jesus, renounce worldliness and ungodliness, and counting the patience of our Lord as salvation is a throwback to verse 9, when he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise of the second coming, as some count slowness, but the Lord is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's I think in Peter's mind what he means by, I've just said this, and I'm saying, count the patience of the Lord. If the Lord, the old school word is tarries, if he delays, if he hasn't come back today, if he doesn't come back tomorrow, count that, consider that, that the Lord has more people he's going to save. And it's our job to get the news out, to get the word out into people's ears before people's eyes and help them understand the gospel and compel them to put their faith in Jesus and be reconciled to God. If Jesus hasn't come back, I think what the Apostle Peter is getting at, if he's not come back, he says, because he's patient and he's got more people he's going to save, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So for us, what does a Christian life looks, look like if we put those together? Diligently, as far as our weakness allows, by the power of the Spirit, seeking to be found by Jesus, unspotted, unblemished, at peace. And if he hasn't come back, we're telling everyone we can about the gospel. And then he reminds us that that is just what Paul has done. Look at the second half of verse 15. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures." I don't know about you, but when we have just finished Romans 7 and then Romans 9 and then Romans 11, and having an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ say, listen, some stuff that Paul says, I get it. It's hard to understand. That's really comforting for me, especially as I've preached and taught those passages to you that I'm like, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure this is what he's saying. But still, I'm like, this is really hard to understand. You see why there are different schools of thought on even the passage that Kelton preached to us today, that he, he brought up there are 
guys that we would go, hey, that's one of my heroes. He believes this. And you go, hey, that's another hero. And he believes the opposite or he believes something different. Yeah, there are different schools of thought on some of that because there are, and notice, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Don't peg Paul as like, ah, I just, I don't want to deal with Paul. It's just a bunch of run-on sentences, as I saw one friend say. No, there are some things in them that are hard. But he reminds us that our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you about these same things. That's what he's been telling you in the letters that he writes to you in all his letters. And then notice at the end of that verse, at the end of verse 16, he puts the Apostle Paul's writings on par with all of the Scripture. That's huge. This is a big insight for us into how we should view Paul's writings, how the early church viewed it, that's important, but what about how an apostle, a fellow apostle, viewed the apostle Paul's writings? And Peter says, I know some things are hard to understand, but these are scriptures as well. And notice again that if, really, if anyone among the apostles had any reason to not really mention Paul or to just not talk about him, it would be Peter. Especially because of what Paul says he did to Peter in Paul's letter to the Galatians. He says Peter withdrew from having table fellowship with Gentile Christians once some Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem. He, he was fine eating with Gentiles because he knows from Acts 10 what Jesus revealed to him. All foods are clean. The dietary laws, they're fulfilled in Christ. Everything's clean. Gentiles, Jews, they're all clean before Christ. But then, being pressured by what the Jewish Christians believed in this day, Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and basically was just like, yeah, yeah, we don't eat with them. They're Gentiles. And Paul says, I opposed Peter to his face because he was, he was living in, con in a contradictory way to the gospel. He's living like the gospel's not true. So it, it appears that Paul, in front of everyone, called out Peter and said, why are you doing that? You're confusing people. That's not right. And Peter apparently repented and even goes on later in his life to call Paul my beloved brother. That's a, that's a cool thing that you, you see in this passage. And that's really kind of how the Christian life goes. We have brothers and sisters that at times will have to call us to repentance, and it is not fun, and it hurts our pride, it hurts our ego, but we should be able to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and even if it hurts our feelings greatly, move on and say, that's a beloved brother. It's exactly what Peter did to Paul, and he mentions that here and reminds that some people, the ignorant and unstable, these things that are hard to understand, they twist the things that Paul says, to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the Bible, as they do the other scriptures. But so remember this right here at Peter's closing. He's giving these commands, commands in closing, but right there in the middle, he just goes on this excursus to talk about Paul. And then he says, oh yeah, by the way, it's really what he's doing. By the way, I know some stuff's hard to understand in Paul which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. Ignorant is a word that just means unlearned. It's, we use it as a dig, like you're ignorant. But it really just means they don't know. He used this word earlier in his letter, and he's talking about new believers who are just at this time ignorant to what God's Word says in totality. They haven't been reading the Bible as long. They didn't even have the Bible printed like we have. So he said these people are ignorant or unlearned, and they're led astray by false teachers. But then he brings that those same words back up here to say, to warn us, essentially, I know Paul can be hard to understand, but for us, the application would be, you better be very careful not to twist what he says because if you do, notice what he says that leads to. The unlearned and the, the wavering of mind, the double-minded, they twist it to what? To their error? Look what he says. Read it. 
to their own destruction. This is the word that's frequently used in the New Testament that means hell, damnation, God's judgment. So we should take our cue from this and be warned, yeah, there are many who do, who twist it to their own destruction, but we need to be careful that we don't do that. And we don't come to the word of God and say, oh yeah, for me that means this. This should be a sobering thing to make us diligent to study the word and land on what we believe it's saying based on study and prayer, not just based on, you know what I think he's saying is this. Peter's saying, you better be careful. You twist this, it's to your own destruction. This is why it's important for all of us to be serious about studying the Bible on our own, with our spouses, with our families, with our community groups, sitting under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and diligently paying attention and seeking to learn and grow, taking advantage of anything you can to help learn the Word of God better and better so that we don't just remain ignorant and unstable. It's the same words that Paul uses in Ephesians 4 when he says the job of the leadership of the church is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that they may be built up. They may grow into the likeness of Jesus. He says so they won't be, so we as the church won't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and basically be ignorant and unstable and be later what he says in error. Be careful not to twist the word of God. It leads to destruction. This is going to get, I think, worse and worse in our culture. I know many of you have plenty of friends that that may frustrate you inwardly because you're like, why don't you care what God's word says? Like you call yourself a Christian, but you it seems like you don't even really care what the word of God says. It's going to get worse, I think. We're going to keep going into more itching ears and itching ears, and we're probably those who are saying, yeah, but what does the Bible say? What is, but what does God say? Are going to be painted more and more like these radical people who need this antiquated book, or you put God in a box where God hasn't said you can't do this, so we say you can. We're saying, but where does God say to do that? I think the more, the longer it goes, it's going to get more and more that people who are saying, we better be really careful not to twist the word of God, are in our culture going to be painted more and more as the dummies who limit God. I think we need to continue to be diligent to say, what does the scripture say? And that needs to be our rule and authority. And then he returns in verse 17, ending the whole letter with another command. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, I think he's talking about that people twist the scripture to destruction, knowing this beforehand, take care, watch out, stay alert, beware that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Paul does it. Peter does it. John says, many false prophets have gone out into the world, test the spirits. The very, one of his last breaths, he's, Peter says, Christians, stay alert so that you're not carried off into this. Stay alert. Take care. You're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. And you'll be wavering. Lawless people, I think it's quick and easy for us to think of those who just live in total debauchery, drunkenness, just perverted sexuality. Really what the word means is those who don't give a regard to what God says in his word. And those who live as if what God has said to us is sort of inconsequential. It's really what it means that led led astray by lawless people 
it's not just the totally apparently aberrant wicked person it's those who don't care what god has said and he's saying you better take care lest you be carried away with that same error and lose your own stability in verse 18 the final command put it in the positive he says but grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. But you, grow. Most of the time this word is used, it's a God causes the growth. And then we have it sometimes that it's a command for you to do it. 1 Corinthians 3 says, well, maybe I watered and or I planted and Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. So he who plants and he who waters is nothing but God that gives the growth. And then you have in verses like this that it is an imperative. The aim of your life should be to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So I ask you, friends, what does your life direction look like? What does your thought life look like? What does your schedule look like? What do the things that Jesus has put you in charge of, what, what does that look like? Is, are you trying to bring everything in your life basically under the lordship of Jesus so that everything is going towards the end of being diligent to be found by him without spot and blemish and at peace? Are you being diligent to grow in the grace and knowledge? Not just grow in grace and we import into that like, oh, I don't know what that means, but for me it means this. He ties those together. Knowledge. Prognosco, it means what we know. So I constantly will appeal to you because I constantly see it in God's word. We must be people of the book. We must be people that are seeking to grow in the grace of God and knowledge about God. It's not just facts that you need to store in your brain, but it's a fellowship with him, knowing him through his word through prayer, through community, through your involvement with his church. We have the commands, be diligent. As we wait for that blessed day when Jesus comes back to purify us, we're to be at work so that our master will find us busy at work for his glory. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. Help us to not be carried away or carried astray and lose our stability, carried away by the same error of lawless people. Protect us, preserve us, strengthen us. Help us in, in light of where we know we're going to be in the new heavens and the new earth forever with you in perfection. In light of that, strengthen us to be diligent. Oh, we want to be found being about your work. When we are nearsighted, when sin entangles us, God, help us repent. Help us to cling to Jesus. Help us to thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us. That nothing can separate us from your love. Help us to know, deeply know, that we are your beloved. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.